Welcome to Chapter 27, Section 4, British Imperialism in India. So Britain was involved in India as early as the 1600s. They set up trading posts in Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta, and in the early days of involvement, the ruling Mongol dynasty kept the European traders pretty much under control. But by the 1700s, the Mongol dynasty began to collapse, and many smaller states ruled by separate Maharajas broke away from the control. And in, sorry, in 17... Hello and welcome to Chapter 27, Imperialism, Section 4, British Imperialism in India. So Britain had been involved in India as early as the 1600s. They set up trading posts in cities like Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. And in the early days of involvement, the ruling dynasty kept the European traders pretty much under control. Um, we call this dynasty the Mughal dynasty, and I very well could be butchering that. I apologize if I am. Um, and, but by the 1700s, this dynasty had begun to collapse. And many smaller states ruled by separate Maharajas had broken away from the dynasty's control. And in 1757, a man named Robert Clive led the East India Trading Company um, and their troops into a very decisive victory over the Indian forces that were allied with the French at the Battle of Plassey. And yes, this is the East Indian Trading Company that you see in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Um, they, that is a actual, they probably did not fight Jack Sparrow, but they are historically an actual company. And from that battle and that moment, the East Indian Trading Company was the leading power over India. So the area that the East India Trading Company controlled began to grow over time. Soon they governed modern Bangladesh and most of southern India, and all territory along the Ganges River in the north. And though officially the British government controlled the East India Trading Company, the company ruled India almost independently until the beginning of the 19th century. They even had their own army, and this army was led by British officers and staffed by sepoys, which are Indian soldiers. And the situation was pretty precarious because some felt that these sepoys could turn at any time against them. At first, the British treasured India for its potential rather than its actual profit. India supplied a wealth of raw material for the industrialized factories back in Britain, and their large population provided a large market for British-made goods as well. And thanks to this, um, India was considered the jewel in the crown of Great Britain. The British also set up restrictions on the economy of India. The policies called for India to produce raw materials for the British, and then for the Indian population was only allowed to purchase British goods and competition from the Indian market for British goods was prohibited. So many industries, such as the handloom textile industry, were nearly put out of business by these restrictions. Eventually, they established a railroad network in India, and this made India even more valuable. These railroads had transferred raw products from the interior to the ports, and then brought the manufactured goods back again. And the plantations of India included tea, indigo, coffee, cotton, and jute. And another crop they grew was opium. And the British would exchange this opium to China for tea and then would sell the tea back in England. India benefited from colonialism, but it was also harmed by it. Um, Britain held most of the political and economic power in this area, and the Indian industries were very restricted. They were not allowed to have their own businesses. And this emphasis on cash crops resulted in a lot of um, a loss of self-sufficiency for many of the villagers. Just like we saw in Africa and in the Muslim countries, um, this made it difficult for the everyday farmer to grow food for himself, which led to famine. And the British officially had adopted a hands-off policy when it came to religious matters and social customs. However, the increased presence of missionaries and the generally racist attitude of most British officials had threatened traditional Indian life. However, much of the world's railroad networks were now in India, and these railroads enabled India to develop a more modern economy and brought unity to all of their regions. 
and along the railroads, a modern road network, telephone, and telegraph lines were created along with dams, bridges, and irrigation canals, which helped them to, again, further develop. Sanitation and public health improved, and schools and colleges were also founded, which increased literacy overall in India. So, and also the British presence brought a lot of peace to the region as they limited the local warfare among all of the local rulers. By 1850, Britain controlled most of the Indian continent. However, not all of it was at peace. There was a constant push by missionaries to convert Indians and this left them feeling conflicted and unhappy. The constant racism towards their people by the British also made the matter worse. And as economic issues also increased, so did the feelings of resentment and nationalism among the Indians. Um, a rumor that began to spread among the Indian sepoys that disturbed them. Um, what they used day to day were, were rifles, and these specifically were called the Enfield rifles. And in order for these to work, they were required that the end of the, the cartridge be bitten off and then used in the gun. And so the rumor was that the ends had been greased with uh, pork and beef fat in order to make them easier to use. However, um, unfortunately, both of these conflicted with the major religions in the area, Hindu and Muslim, as the Hindus hold the cow sacred and Muslims do not consume pork. So this angered the soldiers greatly because they felt as though their religions were not being respected and they were being tricked into disobeying their religion. So a garrison commander was very surprised when one day 85 of his 90 soldiers refused to take their cartridges. And this crisis was handled badly by the British who jailed these soldiers for disobedience. The next day after this happened, the sepoys rebelled. And they marched to Delhi and were joined by Indian soldiers who were there, and together they took over the city. And from there, the rebellion spread. This outbreak has been called the Sepoy Mutiny. And this rebellion spread over much of northern India. The armies clashed violently, and it took the East India Trading Company more than a year to regain control, even with the help of the British Army. Um, around this time, the Indians were unable to stand against the United Forces of the British and the East Indian Trading Company. They didn't have a strong leader to unite behind, and they were also struggled to unite the two major, major religious groups into one united front. And many of the rulers um, were actually supportive of the company and were unwilling to stand up against the ruler, the Europeans. And so this mutiny marked a turning point in India's history. This mutiny resulted in the British government coming in and taking complete and total control of India. Um, the term Raj refers to British rule after India came under the British rule of during the, king, uh, the reign of Queen Victoria. And the British ruler of India was known as the Viceroy, and he took direction from a cabinet minister in London. As a reward to the many princes who remained loyal to the British, they were promised to um, they promised to honor all treaties and agreements that had been put in place by the East India Trading Company. So they were able to keep their throne, keep their money, keep their power, and they were also promised that the Indian states would remain independent. However, the British were gaining more and more control over this area. The mutiny also did not help the racism that was very common in this area towards the Indian people, and it created and increased even more distrust among the groups. By the 1800s, the Indian population began to demand more modernization and representation in their government. One of the most outspoken proponents was Ram Mohan Roy. He was very well educated and very modern thinking, and he began to speak out and push Indians to move away from their traditional practices and ideas. He was against arranged child marriages, which were very common at this time, and the caste separations of Indian life. And he believed that these practices were only contributing to the domination of foreign powers over their country. His ideas and writings were very inspirational to other Indian reformers to join the movement and call for change in India. These nationalist feelings also started to surface because the Indian population were tired of being treated like second-class citizens in their own country. They were limited from rising too high in the government and were often paid less than Europeans for holding the exact same jobs. These feelings developed and eventually two very large nationalist groups were established. They were called the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League. And though initially these were founded to push individual Indian issues, they eventually began to call for self-government around 1906. 
These governments were even further motivated by the partition of Bengal. The province of Bengal was too large to administrate, so the British made an unwise decision to split it into a Hindu section and a Muslim section. And the separation between the two groups made their, limited their ability to unite against the British. However, by 19, it caused a lot of issues, and so by 1911, the British took back the order and divided Bengal a different way. All of these conflicts continued to develop amongst the Indians and the British, but similar struggles were also happening elsewhere in Southwest Asia between the people who lived there and their European powers, which we will continue to talk about in the next lesson. Thanks!